What's up, Gasol Education Nation? Today's episode is brought to you by The Payday Practice and our good friends Jeff Langmaid and Jason Deach. So how would South Gooden, Gary Vee, and Tim Ferriss create a chiropractic practice? The answer is in this book right here. So our good friends Jeff Langmange and Jason Deach, uh, they created the payday practice to basically show you how you cover your monthly expenses in one day every month. Guaranteed, generating monthly recurring revenue in your practice can create financial freedom, eliminate chronic financial stress, and turn the first day of each month from, damn, it's time to start over, to payday. Get a free copy today at www.thepaydaypractice.com. The Payday Practice will show you the exact step-by-step process that you can use to generate monthly recurring revenue in your practice. Get your free copy today at www.thepaydaypractice.com. All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Gestalt Education Show. Uh, today we are in uh, Nashville. We got a great group today, Brett. So uh, we, we, we got some absolute superstars. Uh, you know our good friend Audra Lance. She's been on the show a couple times. Uh, to my right is the one, the only Thomas Bird, Dr. Thomas Bird, the, the, the hip arthroscopy the legend. god, right? Uh, and then uh, someone Don't that we've heard. Everything you hear. Yeah, <laughs> someone we've heard so much about, Ashley Campbell, which is uh, kind of a Dr. Dr. Bird's right hand woman and, and uh, in charge of this beautiful PT place here right here so uh, today we're, we're gonna talk about FAI absolutely we're gonna talk about labral tears we're gonna talk about hip surgery and stuff like that but uh, dr. bird can you just kind of start us through I've read some stories on on the first uh, first time you decided to, to, uh, to use arthroscopy for a hip surgery but what what kind of went through your mind in those those times of thinking through it and then uh, going through with it well, you kind of opened up a can of worms. Yeah. And I, I will back up for a second, and I think that Ashley and I are an important part of our team, but we're just parts of the mm-hmm. team. There's so much that goes into evaluating these patients with hip problems, which for reasons we may discuss in the next hour or so, hip problems tend to be a lot more elusive than other problems like the knee and shoulders. I tell people, you know, I can diagnose an ACL tear, a dislocated shoulder sitting on my couch with a beer watching it on TV, but <laughs> these hip problems just tend to be really elusive. But back to your question about how this started, the, uh, I, I would certainly qualify that Jim Glick is really the father of hip arthroscopy as we know it today out in San Francisco. He, he's the one who brought clinical application to the world and he developed a lateral decubitus technique for performing the procedure. We did our first hip scope here in Nashville in 1990. And at that point, I'd never heard of hip arthroscopy, much less seen one or done one. But one of my partners had a 16-year-old kid with loose bodies in his hip, and she was gonna do an arthrotomy and take out the loose bodies and said, well, what do you think about trying to take them out arthroscopically? And I thought, well, I've never heard of such a thing, but I thought, hey, as long as we don't do something dumb like cut the femoral <laughs> nerve, we'll try, and when it doesn't work, you can just flip them over and do your arthrotomy. And Dr. Andrews didn't teach me how to do hip arthroscopy, but he did instill in me the basic fundamentals that allowed me to figure out how we might be able to take the loose bodies out of the hip just using what he taught me for shoulders and knees and elbows. So we did it, but the bottom line is that it worked. And, and that's where we took them out and then kind of once a year over a couple of years, I'd have somebody with loose bodies that would sort of get sent to me or land on my doorstep. So after a couple of years, we'd done three loose bodies. And that's when probably the, the biggest landmark case came along because one of the physical therapists who worked with this came to me and said, you know, I've rehabbed these people with loose bodies in their hip because I think my brother's got loose bodies in his hip. He'd been in a motorcycle accident 14 years before, injured his hip. He used to work framing houses. He had to quit work because he never knew when his hip was going to give out on him. And all his studies were normal. And we, we thought, well, maybe he got some sort of radiolucent loose bodies that we just can't see on this. We thought after 14 years of symptoms, it's probably not too soon to take a look. And I I really thought it'd be a normal hip scope. And I thought, hey, if I'm gonna scope a normal hip, let's make an educational video out of it. So we videoed it, and I remember we put the the scope in, and what we found was this bucket handle tear of his labrum flipped up inside the joint, which we excised. And after 14 years, his symptoms were gone. And things have to hit me like a ton of bricks. But that's when a little light went off and said, you know, there's other things inside the hip we just don't know about besides loose bodies. And that sort of set us on this trek today. 
Now, that guy, and actually the 30th anniversary of that case was the end of July, and 30 years later, after his labral debridement, he, he still got his natural joint and doing pretty well with it. And that's where labeled debridement isn't always a bad operation, but certainly in today's world with the advanced technology available to us, we're, we're certainly more, much more emphasizing label restoration and repair. But really a, an important message in there is that it's the physical therapist who made me aware of this person who had this labral tear. And that thing carries through, especially today, that so much of what we do is really based on, on what the therapist teaches. And mm -hmm. I could give you one more quick story on that Please. if you'd like me to. That, well, in, in 2004, we, we published a paper looking at your clinical assessment, which is your history and physical exam compared to conventional MRI, compared to arthrograms with MRI compared to the response to an intra-articular injection, and then ultimately what we found in arthroscopy, we found for orthopedic surgeons, just like they teach us in medical school, your history and your physical examination are your most powerful clinical assessment mm -hmm. tools. The problem for orthopedic surgeons is nobody ever taught us how to examine the hip. We sort of beat the knee and shoulder to death, but when it came to the hip, you're lucky if you got one lecture. And part of the problem was that Basically, and this is before arthroscopic surgery was popular, if they didn't need a hip replacement or have AVN as a surgeon, we quickly lost interest in what to do. And that's where all the rehab specialists, the physical therapists are light years ahead of the orthopedic surgeons because they're not looking for an operation. They're just trying to figure out how to help the person in front of them. So a lot of times the therapists are the ones who are nudging you, doc, you know, maybe this isn't so much a, a hip flexor strain that you thought it was. But, uh, that was much more information than you wanted on that. But it's beautiful. It was perfect. Dr. Bird, let's start with what is the etiology of FAI? How, how do these, because it seems like there's been an explosion of these cases. Maybe we're just imaging it better and we're seeing it more. What, what is the cause of this? Or, well, and, and, and definitely, as Dr. Houston used to say, you may not have seen it, but it's seen you. It, it, <laughs> yeah. It's been there. Uh, <clears throat> I sort of came into the FAI, FAI world kind of kicking and screaming. I'm like, what? How could this be a real entity? People have been treating hip problems for you know, hundreds of years, and how could this just come on the scene? And that's kind of a story in itself. But uh, F, FAI, most of it's morphological, just the way the hip forms. Uh, it, and, and we know that there's a difference between FAI morphology and FAI pathology, because mm -hmm. a lot of people have funny looking x rays that have are lifelong active lifestyles and never develop problems. There's studies looking at master's level athletes in their 60s, 70s, and 80s with x-rays that show all kinds of stuff, mm -hmm. yet they've never gotten into trouble. And that's where we know that there's a lot more to FAI than just pincer impingement and cam impingement in a combined fashion. And to me, it, it's really a, very much a perfect storm. There's enough factors coming together just wrong to get them into trouble. And as a clinician, you may never identify all of the factors, but if you can identify enough to reach critical mass of successful treatment, that may be the best you can hope for. And there's a, a lot of things we've broken down. Femoral version's a big deal. The pelvic orientation, and that's one of the things that you can correct with physical therapy, because with pelvic stabilization, there's a lot you can do to selectively unload and reduce the forces of FAI. So it's not, and, and I used to be pretty hard-headed, you know, FAI is FAI, what's therapy going to do for that? But there's so much you can do to unload these joints, reduce their symptoms, regain the quality of their life, get back their ability to compensate. Does early rotational sports with the growth plates open and things like that, is that one of the mechanisms that is creating that CAM defect? Or Well, and, and there's really kind of two questions in there, one of which is, just like we've learned for throwing sports and some other things, does does being a, a high level competitive athlete at a young age, somehow does that influence the development of these FAI, these impingement changes in the hip? Uh, there's no question that being active at a younger age makes them symptomatic, but makes the FAI symptomatic. But did it lead to the FAI forming that way? And it's speculative and, and I feel like there are probably some sports and, and there's a little literature to suggest that maybe with soccer or hockey participating at a young age may influence the formation of these bony changes. That's kind of op open to debate, but what we do know is we don't see young people get into trouble with their hips with FAI 
unless they're involved in sports. And, and that's an important take home message because the treatment's not just about when can I get back to sport, the treatment is about a young person with a lot of years ahead of them, trying to give them the best hip we can for a long time to come. And when you see a young athlete who's already having trouble, you know, it's sort of like the, the, the epidemic of Tommy John surgery where you know, every high school kid thinks that if I blow out my elbow, I'll get it fixed and I'll be better. Well, when you start having those sort of breakdowns at a young age, all of a sudden you may not come back to be a, a, a high level athlete that progresses in the future. Right. What does the clinical picture typically look like in these cases? So in your history, what are, they, what are the things they're telling you uh, in their history when people have FAI and labral pathology? Well, and the, and the clinical picture can be a whole lot of things. And you say, well, that's not much of an answer. And certainly what we look for, groin pain, sharp catching, stabbing pain, flexion activities, flexion with internal rotation, sports that emphasize those things tend to be high on the list who are getting into trouble. But a, a lot of times, regardless of how recently they've developed symptoms, this is the way their hips form when they're 10 or 11 years old. So you've got a 17 year old high school senior this is something that's been building up for five or six years already mm -hmm. and oftentimes by the time they realize uh oh there's a problem going on with my hip they've been compensating for that long before the hip became symptomatic and oftentimes they develop a lot of compensatory problems so sometimes what brings them to you are the compensatory problems somebody pushed over their greater trochanter oh that hurts you got trochanteric bursitis well we know it's not trochanteric bursitis but the glutes are overfiring but well the glutes may be overfiring where they're compensating for the hip i love to talk about this stuff because sometimes the glutes have shut down and then the, the hip flexors are overfiring so they show up with iliopsoas hip flexor symptoms not really you can call it tendonitis but mm -hmm. hip flexor pain because the glutes have shut down and i love to talk about this stuff at orthopedic meetings <laughs> because it makes me sound like i'm really brilliant <laughs> but all i am is a parrot just repeating what this lady over here and her oh. team have taught me do you ever besides the growing do you ever see it travel down the leg as far as pain referral or is it always pretty localized well, well, commonly they have pain referred down the medial thigh. We tend to say the hip joint's not going to refer pain beyond the knee. So if they've got referred pain below the knee, then you start thinking more some sort of a nerve-related yeah. issue. Uh, and then what about the posterior hip? Do you ever see referral into the posterior side of the hip, or is it almost always more anterior? And well, speaking specifically about FAI or hip joint problems, technically that's not supposed to refer pain posteriorly. Right. So when they come in, doc, my hip hurts, and they point to the back and like, nah, that's not your hip joint, that's something else. Whether right. it's SI, lumbar spine, could be a whole lot of other things, but it's not the hip joint. Now, two issues on that are oftentimes, again, they've been compensating for the hip and all these other things are getting stirred up. Or we do occasionally see somebody with an intra-articular problem that presents with posterior hip pain. And that's where an ultrasound guided injection of anesthetic is the quickest way to cut to the chase, put some anesthetic in their joint and just see whether or not their discomfort goes away. That's a simple concept, but the execution, as I actually will share with you, is not entirely simple because if you just send them for an injection somewhere and, but nobody tells them to test it afterwards, <laughs> or you tell them, well, well, keep a journal, and then you come back, they've been keeping a journal for two weeks, all you really care about is what's it feel like during that one to two hours when the anesthetic is in there, and that's the way we do it is they'll come over here and they'll get a functional assessment from Ashley and the rehab team to really tease out the things that are going on. That's a critical part because as I tell people, when I'm evaluating a hip joint problem, if, if I'm meticulous and slow, it takes me about 90 seconds to examine the hip. <laughs> right. It's everything around the hip that's quite complex. But all the issues and layers that could be going on, as a surgeon, I could spend an hour in the office trying to sort all this stuff out. But these people really know how to, how to sort of dissect these things out and, and they can really help to put that picture together. So they'll get a functional assessment, then they'll walk about 10 yards down that way where Beth Bardowski, our nurse practitioner, will do the ultrasound guided intra-articular injection and then Ashley and her team will reassess them afterwards. And on the ultrasound front, and we're very blessed to have Beth who works with us who 
has more experience with ultrasound and ultrasound guided injections around the hip than anybody in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. What about, uh, do, these, do these patients typically have pain with rest? Do they have more, obviously they have pain when they're playing their sports and things like that, but what have you noticed in the history as far as when they're off weight bearing, things like that? And again, you raise some important points because, again, the most favorable thing we look for is this sharp stabbing, catching pain in the groin area, happens with turning, twisting. But sometimes you'll see people where they can do the activity, but then they pay for it later on. But one way, or, and that's a little bit more of a challenge when we're doing diagnostic injections, because say it doesn't hurt right now, but I'm going to pay for it tonight, and by then the anesthetic's worn off. Usually we can figure out a way to kind of work around that. Yeah, and then, okay, so we'll go to the imaging of the hip now. Mm -hmm. uh, you brought up some points that I've heard you talk about before that's definitely different than the way that I was taught, where we were basically taught if you're suspecting FAI or labral pathology, you are getting an arthrogram to be able to assess the labrum. So you've definitely come off that stance, and I don't know what your original stance was, so maybe we can talk about why we don't need an arthrogram to assess the labrum. Well, several things. First of all, we know that MRIs in the hip, just aren't as good as they are, for example, shoulders and knees. They can be wrong all over the place. Even with arthrograms, they can still be wrong. I think, there's, I think the arthrograms give you a little higher sensitivity to things that may be going on in there. The, uh, but years ago, really the, 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 the single thing that we would look for on MRIs when the MRIs weren't as good was whether or not there is any asymmetric effusion in the joint because any excess fluid in a joint is really a telltale sign that something's going on because the hip capsule is not very compliant it's really stiff so you don't see much fluid in the hip versus a shoulder or knee that has a fairly capacious capsule you can get a lot of fluid in there but a little fluid in the hip is sometimes the only thing that we would see to tip us off that the joint was a problem once you put contrast in the hip you don't know if they had an effusion or not the protocol that we used to use years ago is we would get a conventional MRI with some select images, then we would put the contrast in and get the more detailed images of the joint itself. So we got around the issue of, of not knowing if they had an effusion, but also with the contrasted images, it obscures soft tissue and subchondral edema. So there's a lot of things that the conventional MRI tells you much better than the contrasted MRI. Right. And we spoke before, you also use diagnostic ultrasound. Uh, we were talking before we, we got on here about how it can be effective to look at certain parts of the labrum, but also it's a little bit limited in other areas. Can you speak on when you use diagnostic ultrasound as an imaging technique? And, and it's the sort of thing with the availability in our office and the machines are, are pretty reasonable. And uh, I think anybody that's uh, we, we tell people that evaluating complex hip problems without benefit of ultrasonography is like trying to practice cardiology without a stethoscope. You're missing an incredibly important piece of equipment. And, and when we talk about evaluating complex hip problems, all hip problems are complex. Uh, again, it, it's, a, it's a good day when I see somebody shows up with an isolated intraarticular hip problem and nothing else going on. So ultrasound plays a huge role for us, and, and that's when the arthrograms went away completely. Once we're able to do the injections in the office in, in real time, and the ultrasound guided injections are much better tolerated with patients than the fluoroscopic guided injections. There's a lot of reasons for that. The contrast causes discomfort. Plus, they've got to go to the radiology department and take their clothes off and get checked in and move around by people they don't know. Versus here, the way it's done, it literally takes about what a minute from start to finish yeah. no, if, we, if we count really about 30 seconds that uh, it's much better tolerated but and that's where the the, the diagnostic portion of injections as, as we need to because a lot of times people have several things going on and we're trying to tease out how much is the joint how much is abductors or really so is ischial femoral space just to mention a few but the actual visual aspects because ultrasound gives you a different perspective of the structural issues going on around the hip. For example, on an MRI, you may see some abductor tendinosis or abductor tendinopathy, and don't ask me what the difference is, but signal changes in the abductors. <laughs> yeah. And under ultrasound, you can you actually see the structure of those tissues better. And for something like that, you, you see on an MRI, that's where it really helps you to understand the clinical relevance of what you see on the imaging, because 
if you see the damaged area and you can see it under ultrasound, you put the injection in there and if they get relief from the anesthetic, then that supports that what you see on the MRI really is clinically relevant in that person's case. Now before that, we've, we've done a thorough exam, both me examining them, more importantly, the functional assessment that the rehab team puts them through. So we've already got a pretty good idea because then with the imaging, we're using that to substantiate or narrow down our differential diagnosis. Now this day and age, x-rays are considered to be kind of antiquated, but you're a huge proponent of getting hip x-rays. Can you speak on why that's important, what you're looking for, and maybe special views that you would you would want to get for FAI and, and labral pathology? And, and, and x-rays are not antiquated at all. I think in general, if I had my choice between x-rays or MRI, I'd rather have the x-rays. And, and it is uh, amazing how often people show up and they've already had two or three MRIs and the MRI shows a labral tear but you examine them and they've got pain shooting down the back of their leg and uh, there are a lot of people who have imaging evidence of labral pathology that's not bothering at all and not clinically relevant. But on the plain film side, we, we've learned that we're, we're not just looking if there is labral damage, why is it there? What's the architecture of their joint that made it more susceptible to this occurring? So the plain x-rays give you a sense is it, an, is it an impingement problem? Is it a dysplasia problem? Do they have advanced arthritis? Things of that nature. And I think in today's world, most people understand that those x-rays are important. And, and really, I think FAI has brought x-rays back into the main focus. Because before that, a lot of times you'd see people, and they, they had an x-ray of, of one hip, you know, just that hip and nothing else. And we understand that you really need to get an x-ray of the whole pelvis to really tell what's going on with the architecture of the joint. Now, as far as the specific views we do, that's where I tend to be somewhat of a minimalist on the x-rays because there is some radiation exposure associated with it. I mean, but you still want good x-rays. We'll get an AP pelvis and a frog lateral. There's a, the, the 40 degree done view is a popular lateral view to get. There's some other views to get, but also they're a little more, it, it's very easy to get a reproducible frog lateral view. And I like to make sure my x-rays are the same each time so I can sort of compare apples to apples from one case to the next. Those are sort of my basic x-rays. We'll get them supine. Uh, a lot of people that specialize in hip problems would prefer to get a standing AP pelvis. But as we're trying to look, make sure the x-ray is properly oriented, that becomes even more challenging when they're standing trying to make sure that the, the pelvis is going to be properly centered on, on, for the x-ray beam. Dr. Bird, have, you've, have you seen enough x-rays in your career that you see the x-ray before you see the MRI and you have a pretty good prediction of what the labrum status is going to be? I, I, I think that... Uh, by the time I, I've spoken to the, by the time I've spoken to the patient and seen the X-rays, we probably even before you examine them, and then we 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 probably got a pretty good idea of what we may be looking for. And a lot of times, again, I'm just getting the x the the MRI is important. It's, the MRIs are very important. To, but oftentimes, they're most important to rule out other things. When somebody shows up and they've had onset of symptoms in the last couple of months, you want to make sure that they don't have a stress fracture, or they don't have AVN, or they don't have a, a, a strain of some sort, or don't have a tumor growing. There's, there's a lot of things that MRIs are very important to rule out. But beyond that, in general, they tend to underestimate what's going on inside the joint. The thing they tend to be the best at showing is damage to the labrum. But as we know, there's two kinds of cartilage in the hip. The labrum cartilage, which is like an O-ring or a gasket seal around the socket, when it tears, has a lot of nerve endings in it, tends to cause a lot of discomfort. So usually it's damage to the labrum that drives them, that generates the symptoms that drives them into your office. The other cartilage is the articular cartilage that lines the socket and lines the femoral head. As the articular cartilage starts to break down, that's the beginnings of arthritis and the MRIs are not very good at showing the severity of articular damage. Now, the more advanced studies, sometimes you can see it a little bit better. My approach to that is I just assume that the articular damage is worse than whatever the MRI shows, and I talk to the patient about that because the last thing you want to do is, oh, you just got a labral tear, and then get in there and realize the articular cartilage is in bad shape because that's a big head start on some arthritis 
that's the part we can, can't reverse this completely. This might be a good question for you too, Ashley. In the physical exam now, now that we've already talked about the imaging, what are the key tests that you like to make the diagnosis in the, in the actual physical examination with the patient? And, and again, for me, and we, we definitely need to, to take a pause and let Ashley weigh in on this one, because to me, the, the main thing I'm looking for is probably the, the, the biggest thing I'm looking for is it a hip joint problem? Do they have features of core muscle injury, which used to be called athletic pubalgia, which used to be called sports hernia, which some congresses call it uh, inguinal disruption syndrome. It kind of has an identity <laughs> crisis, which confuses it even more. But typically on exam, it's not difficult to differentiate hip joint irritability from core muscle symptoms, but oftentimes there's a component of that. But then looking at the how much is going on laterally, how much is going on in the posterior space, and kind of as we look at that, but I, I'm, a, a lot of times what I do is, is I'll examine them to get a sense of, you know, are we going the right direction to be looking at the hip and like, okay, there is a hip component, okay, let's figure out what else is going on around the hip. And that's where I'm like, Ashley, can, can you help me here? Yeah, that's the longer than 90 second exam, right? <laughs> <laughs> do you want to introduce a couple? Sure, yeah, so I think you know, like he said, the, you need a microphone. The, the easy, yeah, she's good. Yeah. Uh, oh. The easy ones are the ones that are straightforward hip problems that you twist their hip around. Ow, that's my pain. You know, especially when there's mechanical symptoms associated with it. Those are getting few and far between these days. It seems like you know everyone's coming in with compensatory things, or when you're dealing with an athlete, they're coming in at rest or even on exam. They're not overly irritable, mm -hmm. so we kind of put them through more. Of, we call it functional assessment. That's basically a, a easy way of saying do whatever we have to do to make them hurt. Right. So they might be over here, you know, throwing around kettlebells or squatting or doing box jumps or whatever we have to do to start instigating the reason they sh walked in the door. Mm -hmm. Um, because in, in our eyes, if we can't reproduce that pain and then try to take that pain away, we can't do an accurate diagnostic injection. So, you know, I do all the same tests that he does, but a lot of times I'm torturing them before and then doing those same tests <laughs> to yeah. try and really, you know, really hone in on, is this your actual pain? Is this why you came here? Because sometimes you can make their hip hurt, but that's not why they walked in the door. Right. They walked in the door because they have posterior pain that's maybe more back related or SI related. And yeah, we can make your hip hurt and we can take away your hip pain, but that's not the pain they, that they walked in the door wanting to go away. So those are really important differentiating factors because we can, you know, we can say, oh, you have a labral tear and we can fix that labral tear, but it won't take away that pain in your butt that right. you came here for, right? So those are the key things is really for me, making sure that the patient can wrap their heads around what pain they're having and what's present and then what goes away because from a diagnostic standpoint and a surgical decision making standpoint that's the most important factor for our success in getting people better with surgery so. is there anything the latest and greatest as far as labral orthopedic tests for the hip i feel like FAI, I mean, obviously we just move the hip around. We've, you know, flex, adduct, and internally rotate. But then I feel like the orthopedic tests for actual labral pathology a lot of times are very frustrating and don't like, you know, create a very clear picture. Is there anything that you guys have to offer for orthopedic testing for labral pathology? For me, it's more just m multiple tests, kind of checking that box. You know, the more a cluster positive, of tests. Yeah, yeah, the more positive tests that you have that point towards labrum, the more likely the labrum is part of the problem. Right. Um, there's not any one particular new fancy one that I mm. know of. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I would. I would. <laughs> well, I would comment on that that a lot of times, again, it's, it's important to sort of keep in mind what you don't know, what's hiding around the corner that you may never know until a certain point. And, and that's where there's no specific test for me. Oh, it's a label tear. And there are a lot of people trying to figure out how, how can you differentiate a label tear from, but most times with FAI, they're pro, it'd be unusual to have symptomatic FAI and the labrum be entirely normal. For me, if I can just tell it's a hip joint problem, I'm doing good. Right. You know, and, and ultimately, beyond that, we're going to pursue what we can do from a, from a non-surgical standpoint to try to modulate the symptoms. And ultimately, if, if, it, if they've exhausted conservative treatment, which commonly will include having at least tried an intraarticular injection of corticosteroid, not in every case, but I think compared to surgery, trying that route first isn't unreasonable. Don't, again, don't have to do it in every case, but ultimately, when I see in the hip, 
I'm going to see what the damage is and I'm going to address. And as I tell people, that the reason for the surgery isn't just to look around. The only reason for the surgery is we're pretty sure we're going to identify something we can do something about. We know the MRIs underestimate this. Uh, along that same line, again, we spoke about the fact that there are a lot of people with label tears on MRI who aren't having symptoms. The other end of that spectrum is the teenage girls with, who commonly have pincer impingement where their, their femoral head's round, they've just got a little over coverage of the acetabulum, where they're sitting there crushing the labrum, and it'll be painful literally for years before the labrum ever actually tears badly enough to show up on an MRI. Mm -hmm. So we'll see a lot of these teenage girls, the MRI is just kind of normal, but their clinical findings suggest a joint problem. They've gotten a good temporary response from an anesthetic effect of an intraarticular injection, the steroid hadn't been, been effective. There's a lot of those where you get in arthroscopically and the labrum is just draped out over the pincer lesion and it's blottable where you can tell it's getting crushed, but it hadn't torn through where we'll free it up, trim back the rim and restore their natural labrum. So there's a lot of those where the, the MRI findings are normal and we really just depend on, on the clinical findings and the response to the intraarticular injection. One last comment about the x-rays. That For me, I, I tend to be sort of a minimalist and, and, and I think that if you're evaluating hip problems, and most of these people with proper treatment, because we just sort of tend to see the, 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 the worst of the worst or the tip of the iceberg, but a lot of these people have issues that will respond to conservative treatment. Uh, and that's where you don't need to get a whole lot of x-rays on everybody who's, who, where you're trying to some conservative measures. As we get into worrying about instability and dysplasia, we'll get standing AP pelvis x-rays, we'll get false profile views. There's a variety of x-rays that we'll get, but usually those are for people who have, where conservative treatment has already proven not to work and we're drifting towards, is this somebody we might be considering arthroscopic surgery for impingement? Is this somebody who has dysplasia that really needs a PAO? Because Displays is one thing you cannot correct with arthroscopic surgery. And I never met anybody who'd rather have a PAO, a periacetabular osteotomy, over a hip scope. But if it's not, if, if the etiology of their label tear is dysplasia, then you're definitely doing a disservice to try a, a relatively band-aid procedure with arthroscopy. So again, I tend to be a minimalist. And I think for most people, as you're doing a preliminary evaluation and initiating conservative treatment, you don't need to do a whole bunch of these, uh, a long list of all the different type of x-rays that we can get. Ashley, what's a reasonable trial of care time? So if, you know, we decide to treat somebody conservatively for their problem, how long will you have them in rehab before you're like, you know, enough's enough and yeah. we're going to send them to surgery? Mm -hmm. Well, if insurance weren't a factor, the answer would maybe be slightly different. But um, I would say, generally speaking, the simplest answer is about roughly six to eight weeks is what we'll try. Now, my rule is if they're our patient, meaning they live here locally and they're coming here regularly for their therapy and my team has eyes and hands and ears on them, that if after two to three weeks we're not, we've plateaued or we're going the wrong direction, that we kind of put the brakes on and, and circle back to Dr. Bird. Um, but generally, if they aren't local, we're sending them back home, we'll, we'll have it about a six to eight week window. If they're not making some sort of progress in six to eight weeks, they're not likely to, caveat being, the right kind of therapy. Mm -hmm. So if, we're, in, if they're 50% better, then would you extend or is that not enough improvement? To I think that's a totally an it depends answer. You know, are we, are we dealing there? There's a lot of different answers. If we're dealing with a multi-million dollar athlete that has a certain timeline yeah. versus a, you know, 14 year old high schooler that has a totally different timeline and, and outlook. Um, so those have a lot of variables in those decision making, but generally if they're improving and continuing to improve, we'll try and ride that improvement as long as possible, as long as, you know, again, seasons and Positive things of that nature. Of improvement, they're getting better. Yeah. Now. So because okay. we know the better they are going into surgery, the better they are coming out of it and the easier the post op rehab is. So if we can ride the, the improvement train all the way to the peak and then operate, that's the best option or to not have to operate. So what about going forward then as far as post-op what does post-op look for you guys and uh kind of walk us through that sure so i'll, I'll just give you my post-op my talk that i give yeah. all the patients is basically you can expect that they're gonna be on crutches for four weeks 50 percent weight bearing that's assuming they don't have any sort of micro fracture to address grade four cartilage damage um, they're gonna have motion restrictions for about four weeks we limit their hip flexion to about 105 degrees of flexion 
give or take, depending on their tolerance, their external rotation to about 20 degrees. Um, and then he, we typically are, um, he's typically restoring the capsule, so we'll limit hip extension for about three or four weeks, depending on how mobile the person is. And a more hypermobile person will limit that a little longer. So their most restrictive period is that first four weeks. Then we wean and progress all of those restrictions from there. Um, no running, jumping, high impact, pivoting type of things until about 12 weeks, assuming that they're meeting all of the standards to progress. So I will generally tell a patient, if you're going to have a hip scope and you're an athlete or someone who's very active, that getting back to your physical activity is going to be about a six month process and getting back to the level that you probably want to get at is probably a nine to 12 month process. Right. Um, but the worst of it, or the most limiting, is the first four weeks. And then I just tell my patients from the waist down for the first 12 weeks, you belong to me hmm. or therapy, um, your rehab provider. So, and then after 12 weeks, assuming they've done everything that we've told them to do, we can start letting them have a little bit more fun for. Nice. And then what about, uh, do, you, do you have any specific uh, discharge criteria that you're coming back to? Uh, like maybe, are, are you doing things pre-op that you're coming back sure. to, or kind of how's that process Yeah, it, it, it's interesting you bring that up, because that's something we're working on right now yeah. as far as developing some better standards and criteria. You know, we have all these standards for ACLs and shoulders mm -hmm. and elbows, and the hip is kind of this weird one. Um, with cer certainly full pain-free passive range of motion, um, symmetrical to the other side or better because a lot of these people have FAI on the other side that's maybe asymptomatic so their motion ends up being better on their surgery side. Um, we use handheld dynamometer so I want their strength to be you know pretty close to the uninvolved side and again then we start getting into this debate on have they declined on their uninvolved side because they've been limited. Um, so we want to see some symmetry in that and then we actually use some what I would call it's camera based like virtual reality testing for things like agility so we look at acceleration deceleration reaction time so with our athletes I'm not sending them back on the field with poor reaction time or poor deceleration ability and setting them up for re-injury so we'll do a lot of that testing as well when you guys are not doing the rehab program what are the most common mistakes you're seeing what what is it that frustrates you guys that gets done I was going to ask I asked you also way when you talk about strength mm -hmm. comments about sure. not just their strength on testing but endurance and fatigability because yeah. that's where people get oh you're strong great yeah. go have at it i would say this kind of also answers that question you just asked is you know when we put them through their strength testing first of all they're getting tested almost every time that they're in here not necessarily every time with a handheld dynamometer but we're checking strength because some days they walk in and their strength's horrible and we're like what did you do like oh well i went to the predators game and i didn't take my crutches and they're five weeks post-op and they <laughs> hobbled all around nashville and downtown and so they've had a decline, so we'll check it, and then we put them through their paces, and we do a lot of fatigue-based strength testing, which seems to be the bigger issue. Um, what I've seen just over the years in rehabbing a lot of things and then focusing in on hips is knees kind of show themselves a lot more than, than hips do. Like someone who has weakness in their quads and hamstrings after an ACL or a knee procedure, you can you can see it walk in the door. You can mm -hmm. see the weakness, like just kind of walk in the door. With hips, they can kind of hide. So we do a lot of putting them through a lot of fatigue type testing and then retesting their strength. And you'll see these massive declines in their strength that they don't realize and they have no pain and they really don't notice any difference until you prove to them like, hey, you're, you're not there yet. And so what we see happen when they're not in our hands is that they're getting tested for strength, but they're getting tested when they're fresh, you know, not not fatigued not coming off of doing something you know sport related and they get sent back and it's like oh you're good to go and then all of a sudden two months goes by three months goes by and they're calling our office saying i think i retore my labrum because their hip hurts again sure. so that is probably the most challenging piece of post-op rehab for us there's been an explosion of especially in the knee rehab of uh, blood flow restriction do you guys utilize any of those protocols for the hip <clears throat> we do use blood flow restriction we don't have any particular protocol per se for it um, we will definitely use it with our athletes especially ones that are having trouble in that loading getting back to loading heavier weight um, because it gives us the advantage of strengthening them with a little bit lighter load so um, I, I think I see the value in it. You know, I think there's not much from a research perspective out there on how much it affects the actual like, proximal hip strength that we're looking for. Right. Um, but I certainly think it's a very valuable tool to use. What about regenerative medicine in the hip? Are you using any kind of stem cell or PRP or? 
And, and the answer is yes, in a sort of deliberate fashion. I'm going to jump back a little bit on a couple things I actually said. I'm going to back up just yeah, for a second. That for, and the protocols we have are just guidelines that are quite variable. And the main thing is we realize that you know, we're outlining these things and, and people have this thing that goes on called life and just trying to figure out how to fit in it. Like where we talk about 50% weight bearing for four weeks. We don't care if it's 50 or 75 or 25, but just slowing them down on crutches so they know that they had something done. You know, well, come off crutches as you're comfortable. The next thing you know, they're playing backyard basketball. So, you know, <laughs> we, we realize that there, there's definitely a fudge factor built in on that. Going back just for a second, talking about, you know, how long do you try conservative treatment? The, 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 the analogy I always use is it's like asking somebody how much the putt's going to break. Well, it depends on how hard you hit it. How long you give it sort of depends on how long they're doing. If, if they're showing steady improvement, give them as long as you need to. But if they're at an impasse, you don't have to arbitrarily wait three months or six months. Is there anything yeah. that makes for a more difficult case? Like if the patient has loose connective tissue, for example, like or females because they have looser connective tissue typically, does that make for a more complicated case? Well, I, I think from, from a technical execution part, the stiffer the hip, the greater the challenge, the, the more the, the severity of the bony change is important, a lot more work to do, but really the stiffness of the hip is probably the single greatest technical challenge. But the, from a standpoint of getting it just right, people that are really loose to it are the ones where you have to be respectful of the soft tissues and make sure you're not creating any, act. If, if, whether they have any micro instability that needs to be addressed, but at the very least not creating any iatrogenic instability. Going back to a second on, on when, as we see these patients where they come, because when people come to see Thomas Bird, they're coming to me because I'm a surgeon and they've had symptoms for a couple of years and they're now they've been diagnosed with a labral tear and now they need surgery and how fast can you do it they're not coming to see me because they want more rehab so it's definitely a sales <laughs> job and and what go, as we we talk about our, our, our two-pronged attack on that front where we'll do the hip joint injection to get the joint quieted down to allow them to do more because they've all done rehab already I already did well and, and we don't want to just I tell you, we don't want to retrace the same step so Ashley and her team will see them to determine what they've done before, make sure they've got some things we can do differently and the patient's bought into it. We're going to do the injection with the idea of getting the joint quieted down to allow them to accomplish more. Now under that scenario, how long do you, and I tell them, you know, it, it, it's, you've had symptoms for two years, it's not going to take us another two years to sort this out. Typically in about six to eight weeks, we've got a pretty clear idea of which way things are going. I tell them, that doesn't mean in six or eight weeks you have to make a decision about surgery because you're kind of, oh yeah, I don't want, you know, but a moment ago they were saying I want surgery, but <laughs> you just want to get them in the right mindset. That's Because I, I like operating on people. So you sort of, <laughs> but in, a, in about that amount of time, so you, that doesn't mean in six weeks you've got to make a decision about surgery because if things are improving, we'll give it as much time as we need to. But if it's at an impasse, we're not going to drag our feet in definitely. Because right. you got to figure out how to get them to buy into what we're selling. And, and that's got to be one of the biggest challenges of Ashley's job. Right. Back to your question about regenerative, uh, regenerative medicine and such that, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff out there and not all of it's being used in the patient's best interest, right. in, in our opinion. We use it, we're very selective in where we use it. Some of this I'll let Ashley weigh in because Ashley teams up with Beth Bardowski. Beth is really our guru of regenerative medicine because all it falls under the ultrasound guidance. But the places uh, for, for some of the, whether it's tendinopathy or partial abductor tears, we found that the PRP has been very successful on that front. Uh, there's certain other areas as far as intraarticular injections. I, I, I'm not opposed to trying it, and like a lot of things, oh, you don't want to try that. And then, well, you just wanted to operate on me, uh, you know. Not that, uh, but it, with with FAI, FAI is a structural problem. It's not a healing problem. Right. So all, all the orthobiologic injections in the world aren't going to address the structural problem. And if they're just bent on trying it, I'm not morally opposed to it. But it's not something we use commonly in the hip as far as the healing potential. Now, it does have some better anti-inflammatory properties than cortisone, so sometimes, especially for arthritic hips, if you're trying to modulate the symptoms and get them by longer, 
that will tend to use in that setting, but we're really using it more as a super anti-inflammatory than, than how it potentiates healing. Right. Now, Asher, what am I leaving out on that front since? No, I think, you know, the main thing, like you said, we're using it for in our office is the extra articular pathology, especially the abductors. And we see a lot of, you know, what has been diagnosed for 10 plus years as trochanteric bursitis and these, you know, middle-aged women that have had 20 cortisone injections with short-lived, if any, relief. Um, and they've got some crummy looking abductors and they'll fail conservative treatment by standards of PT, if you will. Um, and we'll do a PRP and a course of therapy with that and they actually do quite well. And then the second question is typically from them, do I need three shots? Because somebody told me I needed a series of three. So far, knock on wood, we typically get really good results, I think because of selection process. In right. These patients with one PRP with some solid rehab and they seem to be quite happy um but that's that's where we're doing most of it and a lot of these are most of these are patients that ashley and beth bardowski are teaming up on because beth has remarkable diagnostic acumen with their history and exam findings combined with what ashley can do between the two of them putting their heads together and a lot of these are people that i never see because they don't need a surgeon right and, and that's where as other people and these are sort of things not all this stuff has to get sent to the surgeon i mean I'd like i say for what we do around here, I think I'm an important part of the team, sure. but I'm just one part of the team. And you say, well, who's most important? The answer is yes. I mean, we, everything we do is integrally dependent on, on the skill set that each of the individuals come bring to the table. And which type of athlete are you seeing the most? I know we, we talked before, and you really kind of gain your reputation with uh, the NHL players and the PGA golfers. Uh, what other sports are susceptible? What do you what do you typically see on a daily basis? I, and I'm so bad with numbers. I actually, may I, I suspect we probably see more football player types just because really? there's a lot. Well, it's only because there's more people playing Planet, football. Yeah. Okay. You know, hockey is you know is is very popular in this area, but it, it's still kind of a newcomer. But certainly, as far as the the, the prevalence or incidence in a population, hockey is pretty much number one on that list. Uh, and the golfers are, are a really unique group because it's not just the hip, but how that hip interfaces with their, and, and that's where the, the biggest challenge, those the sports where rotational velocity is a premium, namely baseball and, and golf, and then hockey is, num is, is, a, is a close third on that list. How is, uh, uh, tell about your experience, your first professional athlete, were you nervous and how that all went? Oh, I, I remember it vividly. The, uh, <laughs> that, and, and it was, it was 1997, because 1997, the Houston Oilers moved to Nashville, and the first couple of years, they were the Tennessee Oilers. Mm -hmm. Somehow, I ended up being the team doc. Uh, that, uh, and I remember training camp the very first year, one of our offensive linemen starts developing hip pain. So we did a fluoroscopically guided injection in his joint, got it settled down, made it through mm -hmm. the season. At the end of the season, his hip still bothering him. So I'm thinking I may have to scope this guy's hip, and I'm thinking, Great. How is it the only Yahoo in the league that scopes hips just happens to have somebody on their team that needs a hip <laughs> scope? So I said, this is going to be a short NFL career for me. So we, we scoped his hip, had a bunch of articular damage we cleaned down. It was the sort of hip you wouldn't expect to do very well, but he came back. He was the start of the next year. He did well, and that was 97. So now he's, he's not quite 25 years out. He's still got his neck. He's had both knees replaced, but he's still kicking along with his hip. But I remember... The following year, I presented that case at the at the NFL team physicians meeting at the Combine up in Indianapolis. And I remember one of the trainers, Don Mosley, who came with the team from Houston. Don just retired this last offseason, finally. But he came with the team from Houston. He said, you know, we had some of these guys back in Houston with these groin problems that never got better because I wonder if some of them might have had a hip problem. And it wasn't until years later I figured out that it wasn't that I was the only Yahoo in the league scoping hips, had somebody with a hip problem. There were a lot of players in the league with hip problems. We just weren't any good at diagnosing them. Right. What about, uh, you know, we've kind of talked about FAI, we've talked about athletes. You, you mentioned replacement. What What's uh, – What's your criteria for a hip replacement? Uh, or like, w at what point are you starting to think replacement versus clean outs versus that kind of stuff? Well, that, and, and that's, <clears throat> that is critically important because with FAI, what's the end game? Mm -hmm. I mean, left untreated, what's, what happens to these people? These are the people that you, you used to hear about getting hip replacements in, in their early 40s and stuff. Mm -hmm. that, uh, and, and that's where the, the purpose of the surgery is twofold. 
number one, we want to get them feeling better. We want to improve the quality of their life. And, there, and, and by correcting the impingement, our hope is that we can improve whatever the future holds for. Now, we don't have prospective randomized studies of populations where we treated and didn't treat to, to scientifically tell you that we're altering the natural history. We believe we are, and, and, and I, I believe that, but ultimately, at the end of the day, the main reason with the surgery is how bad is the problem today? Because one of the concerns is, you know, is it gonna get worse if I don't do the surgery right away? And there's a lot of data out there that says, the longer the duration of symptoms, the worse the results of arthroscopic surgery. And a lot of people say, therefore, you should just operate on them right away. Again, and when you see somebody who's had symptoms for three months and they're a you know, 23 year old, you know, recreational athlete, or professional athlete, the problem didn't just start three sure. months ago. That's a problem that's been building up since they're a little kid. Right. And, and that's where I don't think there's a sense of urgency to rush in and do something. There's a lot you can do to modulate those symptoms. That's where rehab has a big sure. role. Typically, we'll try an injection. It's not uncommon. You'll get them back to where they were before the three month point. The main thing I can tell somebody is it's unlikely that the problems are gonna get worse and you not know it. So if the symptoms are stable, there's no sense of urgency to rush in and do something. If we're treating and the symptoms are getting worse, then I think it's better to be proactive and address it with surgery rather than say, well, just wait until it gets so bad you can't do things. But that's where the end result is, could they be looking at a hip replacement in the future? Then one of the questions is, okay, well, because if, if they're developing arthritis, articular wear and x-ray changes, the question that I was asked is, how much arthritis is too much arthritis for an arthroscopic approach? And my feeling is they're asking the wrong question. The question becomes, when, when has the problem progressed that arthroscopic intervention is no longer a preventative procedure, the cat's out of the bag, you've got arthritic changes, arthroscopic surgery is not gonna prevent that from progressing, it's not gonna prevent you from needing a hip replacement in the future. So when it is, uh, has a pendulum swung that it's no longer a preventative procedure, but it's a palliative procedure. You know, you're only 33, why not try, see if we can reduce your discomfort, improve the quality of your life. And, and that's where a hip replacement is an incredibly high bar. In orthopedic surgery, a hip replacement is the most successful of all operations in mm -hmm. orthopedics. So that's an awfully high bar to be thinking about an arthroscopic approach, which is, opinion, oh, you know, it's arthroscopic surgery, you know, I'm only 33, let's try it. But arthritis is bad whether you're 33 or 73. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a harder question to answer that as far as, but, for, but at least the discussion is different because you're not talking to them about, oh, we need to do something now before yeah. this gets worse. Right. It's just, can we improve the quality of your life? And we have enough data, depending on the severity of the damage, to give them a pretty, because as I talk to people about arthroscopic surgery, the number one thing I emphasize to them is, I don't ever operate on anybody and tell them I'm gonna make it completely normal. Mm. I cannot make it as good as what God gave me to start with. But if it's troublesome enough, this is a strategy we have to offer you. If we've kind of exhausted everything else, we can try this. And, and the success of the surgery is determined by how it feels to you. So depending on the nature of the problem, usually I can give them pretty good data what's the likelihood that it'll help enough that they feel like is worthwhile because that's the only gauge of the success of the surgery. It's not based on what I think or how I think things are going. What matters is how it feels to them. And most times we can give them pretty good data and it's not, a, I tell them, you know, whatever it is, it ain't a hundred percent guarantee, but anybody guarantees anything, I'd be heading for the door. Anyway. Yeah, right. <laughs> so a, a lot of that is their expectations as far as trying to decide, do you want to try the arthroscopic approach? And you look for joint space preservation, range of motion, uh, so much of it, and, and that's where I, I tell people, I don't profess to be a great surgeon, that's for other people to decide, but I think I am a good picker. I know how who to operate on, and who, I know who not to operate on. Now sometimes, uh, and a large part of it is based on the, the feedback I get from Ashley and Beth and Kay Jones, my nurse for 30 years, who knows more about evaluating hip problems just with history alone, that sometimes we will push the envelope and we will try it on people where the objective parameters say this isn't a good idea and more times than not we'll, we'll come out on top. That's cool. Do you see a genetic predisposition, meaning are you seeing like siblings of people that you're doing surgery on also more susceptible? And, and the answer is absolutely. There is a genetic predisposition. There is a guy I saw Friday in the office who's 
he, he came up here to help care for his father who had a hip replacement and then his hip started bothering him and they got an MRI <laughs> showed a labral tear well he had a lot of subchondral changes in his acetabulum I'm like I can do arthroscopic surgery I can repair the labrum but with the articular changes it's just not likely to be a big difference for it I didn't have any problem and this guy was like uh, 38 I didn't have any problem convincing him about a hip replacement because he had just helped his dad recover. Because the, the, the paradox is that getting over a hip replacement is a cakewalk compared to getting over these arthroscopic procedures because there's so much more in protecting the, in the, the, what you're repairing and things of that nature. So as far as what to get, and, and that's where arthritis is bad, like say whether you're 73 or 33. And in today's world with the technology of hip replacements, they're pretty doggone durable. And I wouldn't tell a 33 year old it's gonna last for the rest of your life. But the flip side is if they're at a point their quality of life is terrible, are they supposed to drag it around until somebody tells them they're old enough to be thinking about a hip replacement? I don't know if anywhere in there I answered your you did. question. Yeah, but you did. On the other end of the continuum, I asked before we started if you would ever prophylactically do a surgery. You get a 10-year-old kid who knows going to be a superstar hockey player. Uh, they already are showing signs of FAI. The labrum is fine at this point, but you know that it might culminate in a labral tear at some point. And you said, you didn't even think about it, you said absolutely you would never operate on somebody in that scenario. And I think under the scenario, because basically, and, and it's very, now first of all, if you're seeing somebody who's asymptomatic with their hip, what are you seeing for? Right. Something brought them in. And, yeah. and that's where, and the common thing is they may have a hip flexor strain or something else and you get an x-ray and they've got these FAI features. And if you dare get an MRI, a lot of times you'll see some abnormality where maybe they're not symptomatic. And we've seen people with all kinds of MRI findings who just never seem to develop symptoms. So if they're pain-free, I wouldn't. But I definitely start sort of warning them about it because you treat whatever's going on around the hip. Now, a lot of times, again, as the, as the symptoms creep up, I always use the analogy about that. They talk about if you take a, the, 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 the fable about if you – take a frog and, and, and drop him in a pan of boiling water, he'll just jump out. Mm -hmm. You take that same frog and you put him in a pan and then gradually turn the water up, he'll just sit there and cook without knowing what, it, that's what FAI does sometimes and it's gradually cooking the hip so that by the time they realize there's a problem, the, the damage is pretty far gone. So I, I think all that's a long-winded way of saying that's where sometimes at least doing a diagnostic injection of anesthetic because sometimes you go, oh, wow, that's what a normal hip's supposed to need. No, I didn't realize it was bothering me that much. So I, I think something brought them in to see you. And if you see they've got evidence of damage in the joint with the FAI, you want to start laying some crepe about it. Now, the other place we see that commonly is we'll see somebody with one hip symptomatic and the other one's not. You know, and you're, So you tackle the one that's symptomatic and watch the one that's not. But so many times, and, and Ashley may have a better sense for this, that as they're recovering on the symptomatic side and they realize, hey, this is pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> that other one as good as I was thinking it was. The other name we hear uh, in this world is Mark Philippon. Uh -huh. I know you uh, you know him well. Is Are you guys doing the exact same repairs? It's interesting, like if we talk about Tommy John surgery, like depending on if Alitrage does it versus George Paletta versus, you know, all check, they have like little minor differences in there and how they do the surgery and things like that whether or not they move the ulnar nerve, like, you know, these mm -hmm. little small details. What about with the, with the FAI labral repair? I, I think by and large, Mark and I are much more the same than we are different. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and as I tell people, you know, if you go talk to five or six different people that tell you they're experts on hip stuff, you've got five or six kind of seemingly different answers because people go about it differently. I, I think Mark and I, are, are more on the same page right I, and, and I, I'm a big admirer of Marx because of, of he he really raised he's been an incredibly innovative person and he has kind of raised forced everybody to get more innovative through the years and, and this is this isn't my saying this is somebody else but the because uh, and if Mark and I were sitting here we would agree that he probably falls on the more aggressive side and I probably fall on the more conservative side of addressing things. And that doesn't make him wrong and me right. And I hope it doesn't make me wrong and him right. But most times the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Right. And that's where somebody said this, and I don't even remember who it was. They said that uh, 
Mark was, that, that I'm the grandfather of hip arthroscopy and Mark is the rock star of hip arthroscopy. <laughs> <laughs> Who would you rather be? Yeah. <laughs> exactly I, right. I'm a big admirer, I, I, and especially, uh, I've, I've got just enough more gray hair than Mark has that I've had a chance to watch his career. And, and the, the things he's doing in today's world, not just what he's doing with the hip, but what he's doing with the Stedman Clinic and the Stedman Philippon Research Institute, it's just some incredibly remarkable stuff they're doing. They are really pushing the envelope at this point, not just in hip, but really across all avenues of how to improve the care for athletes at, at every level. Uh, Dr. Bird, when you're operating someone 20 years from now, is it going to be the same? Or do you think, like, is it, do you see the procedure evolving more? Or do you think 100 years from now they'll be doing it basically the same way that they're doing it now? Or what, what is your take? Uh, on? You know, the, uh, this FAI stuff just, and I'll back up for a second and talk about sort of the evolution of hip arthroscopy is different than the evolution of other joints like the knee and the shoulder. Because the knee and the shoulder, we basically went from traditional recognized open procedures for recognized pathology to less invasive arthroscopic approaches. But for the hip, we weren't doing big open operations for unexplained hip pain. So with hip arthroscopy, basically we went from doing nothing to taking a look, seeing some damage and trying to figure out what to do to it. So we're in there trying to tell what's normal, what's abnormal, what to do with the abnormal stuff. And we had no clue about why they had the abnormal stuff. And that changed in 2003 when Professor Gons published his paper on FAI as a cause of joint damage. And that's when the evolution of hip arthroscopy now did parallel the knee and the shoulder because the open surgeons were doing FAI surgery. So we just rapidly went about trying to figure out how to do what they were doing open in a less invasive arthroscopic approach. And again, the first time I ever heard about FAI, I was teaching a course at the Learning Center in Chicago and I was pontificating about a tennis player with a label tear. One of the guys in the audience stood up and goes, that guy's got FAI, he's got this bump on the femoral head, that's what led to the label tearing. I remember thinking to myself, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Fortunately, I had enough sense to think it and not say it out loud. So I kind of came into this thing kicking and screaming. So who knows what, now the, the flip side is that door swings both ways because that was 2003. 2003, I first met Professor Gons because we were speaking together on a program at the EFRT meeting, European, I don't know what EFRT stands for, but it was in Helsinki, Finland. We were both speaking on the same program. And when we got, and, and hip arthroscopy didn't exist in mainland Europe back then because Professor Gons didn't believe in it. And, and after, after I spoke, Gons came up to me and said, you know, I'm not ever gonna do this hip arthroscopy stuff, but I may send one of my young partners over to spend time with him. So he sent his young partner, he stayed at my house. He was there a few days before I figured out it was Gons' son-in-law. And I was wondering, is this come some kind of setup where he's just over? His, <laughs> but so, so even Gon and, and, and Gon, I think he, he just a reflection of what a big person he is. That somebody was so adamant there was no place for hip arthroscopy. To say he embraces it would be a stretch, but at least he was tolerant of it. And and Michael Looning, his son-in-law, is probably about the premier hip arthroscopy guy in Europe these days. Right. Wow. But as far as where this is going, the sky's the limit. You so know, 2003 it, is when it was a first described. That's that's correct. You know, and it was that's when the paper finally got published on that. It, you know, people kind of were a little aware of it before, but that's really. It. We're back. We're back. Uh, Dr. James Andrews, he spoke quite a bit to us about the importance of learning from your failures, uh, and I, I feel like you seem like a very humble human being yourself. <laughs> so, can you talk about the importance of along the way having some failures and picking yourself back up and uh, learning from those? You bet. As, as a as Mark Twain said, experience is the thing that tells me I've made this mistake before. Well, I've had lots of experience. And, <laughs> and, and, and yes, trying to learn. I, I think that fortunately, my father, chief, chief of surgery back in, in the 1930s, said to one of his residents, said, son, you don't have to learn all the complications for yourself. You can read about a few of them. Uh, <laughs> I think that, and, and that's what I tell people, you know, you can learn from me. Don't go out and try. But also, I, I, I was blessed that to, to the experiences, I mean, like I say, Dr. Andrews didn't teach me how to do hip arthroscopy, <clears throat> but he sure set me up for being able to accomplish it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where in today's, because as we talk about label repairs and label reconstructions and how good these are, well, 
how does that mean things were doing before? And that's where, for me, with, with label management, kind of, I was, you know, I was cautious about getting into repair because historically I had to have a compelling reason to repair the labrum because the results of label debridement were pretty good. Uh, the repair techniques were, weren't well defined. We didn't have good technology. The rehab process was onerous. And there's now a growing number of literature that says label repair is better than label debridement. All those papers are flawed for various reasons, but the bottom line is there's no literature that suggests that debridement is better than a repair. So in today's world, I have to have a compelling reason not to repair the labrum because the, the, the healing capacity of the labrum is well understood. The techniques and technology for repair action on the rehab, pro, pro, uh, re, rehab program has been sort of streamlined. So again, that, that's kind of, that's one aspect of evolution. And, and, but I think fortunately, we went from having nothing to offer these people to having something to offer them to being able to do those things better. As we learn more about the etiology of the label tears and articular damage, and we're starting to scratch the surface on addressing the etiology, but I don't feel like we ever took a, 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 a detour. And, and kind of the one example, and, and probably with one minor exception, but for the sports guys, that some of the biggest names you ever heard of were on a paper one time about how they didn't think the meniscus was important, so they would take the medial meniscus to reconstruct the posterior cruciate ligament. And some of the biggest names you ever, that didn't, fortunately that didn't last very long before they realized that really the meniscus was pretty important. You didn't want to just be, uh, I feel like we've managed to, to avoid some of those detours where we just completely went the wrong way. So I, I feel like that, that uh, we, we and, and that's where a lot of this, the things that, the, there's a lot of things, in the, the instrumentation and the technique, the technique that everybody uses around the world is what we developed here. Uh, but beyond that, the, the, the technology everybody's doing today, I'm learning so much from these young people, just figuring out how to do things better. And fortunately, uh, I feel like there aren't many things that we did were, were bad, but just figuring out how to do better. And again, you know, they got my first label debridement was 30 years ago, and he's still doing well 30 years later. If you just use that as a benchmark, what do you need to be doing label repairs for? But yeah. the, the as a backdrop to that, you know, back then we weren't scoping people's hips who just bothered them for a little bit. These were people with protracted symptoms and exhausted conservative treatment. They didn't have arthritis or we would have just told them to hold on until they needed a hip replacement. So these were folks who had already proven had pretty bulletproof hips. When you're doing a label to be when a guy's already had symptoms for 14 years and normal x-ray, he's kind of proven to have a pretty bulletproof hip. Yeah. That, but that's not what we're seeing in today's world. What we're seeing is people whose hips are going bad right before your eyes and they don't need to just go in and clean it up. You need something to try to slow down that process, especially the young people. And Because when we published our 10-year follow-up on label debridements, 80-something percent of them were still doing well. And, and you say 86% good results, what's the big deal? Well, that's because these were patient, patients who were highly vetted that had proven to have pretty bulletproof hips. And, and when we looked at those who had arthritis, pretty much all of those who had arthritis had gone on to hip replacement. There was about 20% that hadn't, but also a hip replacement is not a single benchmark because of that 20% who hadn't gone on to hip replacement. It wasn't because they were doing well, they were just miserable but deciding to live with it and not get a hip replacement. So that's kind of some of the historical things. We have to be very, very careful how we interpret that data. But I, I think the idea is we're doing better. Right. That was a long-winded answer to a simple question. I've heard it said, too, experience is what you get when you don't get what you want it. <laughs> it's uh, another way to put it. Right. What do you, uh, are you plateauing at all as a surgeon? How would you say, we always ask this question to the physicians, do you feel like you're still getting better, you know, by the day? Or? I or better be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now, and that's, and again, one of Dr. Andrews saying was when you're green, you're growing, and you're ripe, you're next to rotten. If you, <laughs> if you think you got it all figured out, you better look out because the world's getting ready to pass you by. And, and, and that's the thing that, that, that I, I'd like to think I focus on the most is trying to stay in touch with what, as somebody said, you don't want to be the first or last person to adopt new technology. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there. I kind of scratch my head and go, I don't know about that. But then again, like I say, you know, I, I thought FAI was the dumbest thing there ever was. That, uh, <laughs> so I, 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 I've at least learned enough to, to try to, I think the key is to stay open-minded. Yeah. 
you don't have to be too adventuresome, but definitely be open-minded. Keep an open mind, but not so open that your brain falls out. Is the one <laughs> yeah. that I was <laughs> oh, too out. late. <laughs> what uh, do you have? Any, were you going to ask a question? Uh, I, I just think uh, what what goes in. Obviously, you've built this team too. Like you're you're also managing people. Mm-hmm. I, I would assume. And so, what are some of the things that you you looked at maybe when you were courting uh, our, our friend or? Therapists or things like that. What are some qualities in, in good physicians or good PTs, good front desk people that, that you like? Well, I, I definitely ascribe to the Denny Crumb School. You know, my my, my leadership style is is the the Denny Crumb School of, of coaching. And Denny Crumb was a legendary coach. University of Louisville won several national championships. They said, you know, the way what he did is he just went out and got the five best athletes, rolled the ball out there, and let them do it. Well, yeah. I just I've, I've tried hard to surround myself with an incredibly talented bunch. Sure. Uh, and just let them do what they do well and I'll sit over here and do my part and a lot of my part is influenced by them nudging me the number of times that I'll kind of have a, a, a mindset and sometimes they worry about it a little bit but mostly they know they can come and tell me what they think even if it's not what I want to hear and most times on that front they're more right than I am but every now and then I'll hold my ground sure. it's, it gets harder and harder sure. but the, the, this is all dependent on the team and the people that are here and the team we have, none of this are things that I envisioned. Again, when I first thought about FAI, I mean, literally, I, I hope I didn't ever utter these words, but it, my thought process, I'm, I'm a big believer in physical therapy. I've trained with Dr. Andrews. I don't know about prehab and all that stuff, but FAI is FAI. What's therapy going to do for FAI? I mean, that was kind of my thought process. I mean, that kind of tells you where I started with this. So, I mean, none of this was brilliant. So these are things that they had to beat me over the head to get me. You know, the first time I heard about ultrasound, you know, all these squiggling, that's so stupid, the little squiggly lines. That, uh, and, and actually, there's a guy named Carlos Guanche out in, in, uh, in, in SCOE in California with Steve Snyder's group. He said, Thomas, no, you really got this ultrasound stuff. So he, he can, and he's somebody I respect, so he convinced me to, to sort of look into it and, and sent people out there to sort of learn from him. That, uh, we, and it's just kind of evolved. And fortunately, we've had some, because what we do isn't just the position, it's the, it's the person. Right. And that, mm-hmm. they're not just interchangeable. Right. What about and they take uh, pity on me and stick around. <laughs> What about from uh, from your perspective? So, what makes yeah I'm much what, more interesting? Yeah, what, what, what makes Doctor Bird so special? Number one, and then uh, you know uh, <laughs> what what are some things maybe you've learned along the way from him? Hand your mic. Well, you know, I think more than anything, just you know, his respect for therapists and the rehab profession as far as our place. Um, so you know, he'll always say we don't tell him how to do the surgery and he doesn't tell us how to do the rehab and yeah. it works really nicely. Mm-hmm. So you know, it makes for a really good team. So and to as a rehab professional you know i think we do a really good job and to feel respected from a surgeon and not being talked down to or that sort of thing is is an environment that most people want to work in so um i've been here for about eight years now and built a grown a team of rehab around us that are are really great and you know he also encourages us to do the fun things like go speak at meetings and do some of the research and I try and surround myself with people who think that that's fun because we're nerds um you know and so that just breaks up the monotony of the day in and day out grind of of you know we love taking care of people but it's also nice to get out and do things like this or yeah. meet up with people at meetings and it's been really fun to do that so and we have I mean I'm just one person in a very large team of people that make this little world go around here so sure. we're very fortunate sounds like you have good culture that's one thing we notice like across <clears throat> the board when we when we do things like this like the they're really greats in the world they've they have great culture with their team around them and I think that's like critically and vitally important yeah and it's all centered around making sure we get people better so mm-hmm. every single person here I mean to a fault we will be emailing patients, patients back <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. yeah like we I'm sending emails at 10 p.m. or Sunday mornings and you know and because that's what we do we take care of people mm-hmm. and people you know we like to think that we can make their lives better so it's every once while you run into somebody you don't help what are their options so if you've already done a fai labor repair on them they've gone through the rehab protocol exactly like they're supposed to do and that we don't have symptom resolution what what other tools do you have to go back on at that point well we both can answer that out but before we get and and that's uh, unfortunately that's not an uncommon scenario and we just can't 
help everybody. Yeah, right, that, exactly. Uh, before we get to that topic, I'll back up on, on, on Ashley. That That's what makes Ashley special is that all those things that she just mentioned are fun to her because that's <laughs> what makes it work for everybody right. here. Sick and twisted, aren't you? Yeah. Because as a, there are a lot of people that can do what I do, but I don't think there's anybody that can do what we do collectively on the level that we do. I just, I just think that, you know, fortunately, it's actually a fairly small team, and, and it does make us nimble, and we can adjust, and we can you know, sort of listen to each other. Mm -hmm. But back, and again, back to the more gory question of, you know, we don't help everybody, and 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 sometimes you just know there's only so much we can do and sort of knowing when to draw the line in the sand and say we've done what we can do but I think more often than not we want to make sure we're not just sticking our head in the sand that uh, that trying to look at it from every angle because I use the 80 10 10 rule in rehab which is that 80 percent of the time the the smoothness smoothness with which the rehab goes is a linear correlation with the compliance and quality of the rehab 10% of the time you see people that do everything exactly as you ask them to, but they struggle anyway. And then 10% of the time you see people that never do a doggone thing you tell them to mm -hmm. and somehow sail through like nothing right. ever happened to them. And it just kind of, <laughs> but again, it, and why people aren't doing well is, is so multifactorial. And we live it with that on two levels. One is we get a lot of patients in here who've had surgery before who aren't doing well. And again, they're coming to me because they're ready for the next operation that's going to. Sure. And, and most of those, I, and I don't, we don't know what the exact statistics are, but Ashley probably has a sense. A lot of those don't ever need another operation. They just hadn't yet gotten over the operation they had before. Uh, but when then when it comes to your own patients, you know, th that you have to make sure you're being uh, ob objective and not sort of trying to cut yourself too much slack. and. I don't know, actually, that we struggle with each, it's hard to give you a great answer because we struggle with that each and every time. Right, right. Yeah. I think the big thing for us, at least the thing I've seen change in the, you know, eight years of being here is a, a big shift into this, people who are showing up who've had previous scopes, whether it's one, two, three, or more, um, and then they're showing up saying, what can you do for me? And it's like, okay, there's a lot to unpack here, right? Like there's a lot to, to go through. And that's where, although it's exciting how much hip scopes have evolved and that, you know, more and more people are getting trained in how to do them. I think all of it very much comes back to the patient selection. That's what he'll harp on always. And Helps I think- batting average if you pick the right patient. Exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, I get, I people reach out to me on social media, I get emails, all these different therapists saying, well, I see hip scopes and they all fail. And I'm like, well, it, it, and to me, it's not because it's, bad surgery bad surgeon or bad surgeries it's probably just the wrong patient good surgery wrong patient or wrong timing um and that's where timing's everything we we spend In a lot life, of right? a lot of time working on that and from the standpoint of me from a education and speaking perspective i like to those are the talks i gravitate wanting to do is is coming back around to patient selection mm -hmm. like we have great surgeons we have great tools and techniques and we have great rehab protocols but if you do all those things on the wrong person they're still not going to get better right so that's i think that's where we really need to if the pendulum's going to swing back towards the center on this stuff that's i think it's not going to be the next greatest tool or you know suture anchor it's picking the right patient right <laughs> so. yeah Good point. I, I remember how they used to talk about ralph nader saved more lives than most surgeons uh, you know he was a guy that you know <laughs> yeah. sort of brought the corvair out anyway the, uh, <laughs> but I, I think one of the things on the horizon which may be I, I hope will be hugely important is because again i like to brag that i know how to pick the right you know, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty good i'm not bit, batting a thousand but also a large part of that is the feedback i get from ashley and kay and beth and kind of what their thoughts are that from everything ranging from if you ever operate on that person I'm leaving to, <laughs> to when you meet them you're gonna think they're crazy but just, re, what, just, un, just underneath just there it, underneath it Bear if you'll us. just you know and so, and so it's not me making the decision it's us making the decision uh, and, and maybe not every patient but so many of them almost everybody has some input there's other things that are going into my algorithm on trying to decide who to operate on but again, you know, and again, I learned that from Dr. Andrews, and oh, I'm so great with you know. But, but how do you how do you teach other people how? Because you can teach them how to repair labrum and how to decide how much bone to take out. But how do you teach? And, and that's where I, I think that and Matt Preventure is one of the people leading the charge. A good friend of mine who's actually at, at, at with Mark out in Vale now. 
he was in the Navy. Uh, but and they're, they're talking about this brief re resiliency score that they started using, especially with shoulders and stuff, sort of just determining people's ability to bounce back from mm -hmm. adversity. And it's not specific to surgery or even uh, injuries. It's really more of a, I think, a Life. psychological mm -hmm. testing thing. But they're figuring out how to, because if we can figure out, you know, how can we, the people that are good at talking to people and figuring out who not to operate on or who to operate on, that, uh, that, 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 how how can you quantum how can you put that in a measurable fashion so because i think it if if we can teach other people how to pick the patients properly that's probably going to do more for success than all the other gidgets and whizmos and things that we <laughs> teach them or, or how to teach them what you know how, how to use yeah. lasers or anything else right right well i think we, I mean, one thing i learned with dr angie's when we'd send players down uh, we know he's a great surgeon, but the uh, the players, the players' wives, the players' kids, they loved him. Oh, yeah. you know, like, so he's got a lot to him mm -hmm. besides being a great surgeon. You know, he's got great charm. He's empathetic. He's he's a coach. I mean, you know, it sounds oh, yeah. like you have a lot of the same qualities. So I think that's important to expose that too, because a lot of times, like you're saying, people think it's just it's more than just repairing labrums. There's more to managing cases. You know, to get people on board for what you're for what you're doing. They're intangibles of good healers. You know. But again, on that, that that's kind of that, that as a breakthrough, how to to improve everybody's results. I, I think the more we can learn about whether it's the brief resiliency score, and but sort of going down that avenue of just figuring out how people who, because it's not just a matter of figuring out where they are, what is their resiliency, but is it modifiable? Can you maybe say, hey, you know, let's let's coach you up for a little yeah. while and put you in, because that's a lot of, a lot of, I see people, I know they're going to need surgery, but we just need to get them coached up first. Yeah, sure. Well, what about, uh, we haven't talked to Audrey yet, we've been a little infatuated over here, so uh, talk about the customer service side or the, the stories on this side. You've been lucky enough to send some of your high, high profile people over here, so what, what do the athletes say uh, about it? Um, just that it's a great experience. Everyone's like listens. I think that's really important, especially to hear the athlete and mm -hmm. you know know, know that whole part of like you guys talked about with Dr. Andrews their story, not just I need to play tomorrow, but the whole background of it mm -hmm. um, and what they're working with. But everyone raves about coming over here, and there's a lot of um, some. Of, I just had a patient that I sent over here who is a high-end um, athlete and college runner, and his mom called, and she, both Dr. Bird and I think it was Ashley that was working with, on him, goes, they said the exact same thing you said. The exact same wording, <laughs> anatomy, everything. And it was just, it's just nice, like, okay, we're all on the same page, you know what you're gonna get, you're gonna have these same conversations reinforced. Um, so it's really nice to have a team of people to, hey, you're gonna be taken care of. Right. Right. It's a breath of fresh air because sometimes the orthopedist, can, you know, the, the MO is that they can be a little cocky. So, mm -hmm. like, you and uh, Dr. Andrews are very approachable, and, I mean, I think that's very admirable. I hope uh, I learned something from you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I had one more question. You brought it up, so i got to ask you about this. Uh, what is your take on sports hernia without, like, diving so deep into it? Obviously, it's in the differential diagnosis <clears throat> when people come, you know, for, for what your specialty is. But... Are are athletes being over operated on it? What do you what do you think about the the injury? And I, I think like anything, there are circumstances where it's getting over operated and circumstances where it gets neglected. It it's a real entity. Yeah. That uh, and it's a common entity. Uh, we see it a lot with our we see it a lot in our world for two reasons. One of which is it can be hard to tell. Is it a in which word did you use? Sports hernia. Sports hernia. I'm going to use sports hernia. You know. Bill Myers would be calling you and it's, 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 it used to be athletic pubalgia, but then he figured out that ESPN didn't like using the word pubalgia, so he changed the name to core muscle injury. Yeah, that makes you want to use it more. But, yeah. <laughs> so, but anyway, talking about sports hernia, it's kind of, or yeah. whatever you, you can want to call this, const, this confluence where the rectus abdominis inserts and the adductors take off along the brim of the pelvis. The... Uh, it's a real entity, and it can the, their, their symptoms can be similar to joint problems, so they can kind of overlap, but they commonly coexist, and it's easy to understand why they coexist, especially with FAI. If they have reduced hip motion, that's compensated by increased pelvic motion, which puts more stress on the pelvic stabilizers, and then those structures start to break down. 
And as far as the treatment, because a lot of times you'll see people have part of both going on. Uh, certainly, if I had to have surgery, I'd much rather have sports hernia surgery. That's a lot easier surgery to bounce back from. And, and there's no question the threshold for that surgery is lowered. And in our world, it certainly has because for example, if we have somebody who fights with it during the season and maybe doing an injection or two, get them through the season, the end of the season, you know with some time off, it may recover and heal and be okay. Mm -hmm. But also, if it doesn't, and all of a sudden in, our, in the football world, if OTAs roll around in May and they're still having symptoms, they're looking at us, why didn't we? T and, and I think the morbidity of the surgery is not great. So a lot of times, if they've proved to have sort of a stubborn problem, we're pretty quick to encourage them to go get it operated on because the, the surgery tends to be pretty doggone successful. Sometimes it's not as successful as people say it's going to be, but it is pretty successful. And, and the, the rehab, that they don't get back as fast as people tell them they will, but they do get back. There's, there's not a lot of morbidity associated with it. So and the risk rewards versus, you know, FAI surgery to me, that's a big deal. I mean, you're going in and you're changing the way people's hips are and you're doing all this stuff. I mean, that, 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 that's a big deal even though it's done arthroscopically. But the core muscles, and, but core muscle surgery, most times, if it bothers you bad enough, we'll do something. Right. You know, versus with the hip, if they're having symptoms, we were, oh, well, this may be worse in the future. We need to do something. But core muscle stuff, sports hernia, more symptomatic treatment. If it bothers you bad enough, we got something you can do. If you can live with it, go on about your business. Perfect. Beautiful. Ah, what a great, I think a great spot to stop. We've, we've taken so much of your time. We're so appreciative, both of you, uh, for allowing us to be here on a Sunday, number one, uh, and then uh, for, for helping to educate our, our audience and educate us. And so uh, it, it is just a, always a breath of fresh air. I get the same kind of feeling uh, that, that we got around uh, our surgeons that we love, like James and, and uh, so some of the people that are, are titans in the profession. And so uh, we, we thank you for, for your service. We thank you for, for trusting awesome people like this to do run this rehab area and yeah it, it's it's truly truly awesome so thanks thank for you. having us yeah, yeah thank you very much <laughs> yep thank you. rock and roll guys all right well uh stay tuned for more episodes and uh we'll talk to you soon thank you i hope you enjoyed this episode of the gasalt education show uh if you liked it share it subscribe to it uh send it to your friends send it to someone that needs to hear this message uh, we really want everyone to be able to, to tune in and, and get the the best clinical advice that they can which uh, we're hoping that we're giving to you with these special guests so um, if you have any questions please feel free to reach out to us or if you have any suggestions on upcoming uh, conversations let us know uh, for a list of our upcoming courses we're adding them all the dang time so go to gestaltedu.com click on courses and they'll all be right there for you all right have a good day